So now we turn to Misha Lubitsch, who's going to talk about renormalization. Thank you, Renan. So, but uh, no sense to the organizers because. <laughs> They actually failed to invite me, and so when Dennis did it, invited me, they actually resisted, but in the end, it turned out that Artur is not coming, and so I had to do his job. So thank you, Dennis. So now I'm, <laughs> I'm working now. All right, so uh, yeah, so this is the beginning of our mini program in renormalization, and it will be a mini course, so the program for the mini course has changed a little bit because Artur Ravel, as I have mentioned, cannot come. So I will give the first two lectures, and in the first one, in this one, I will attempt to give some general idea of renormalization and different appearances, different applications on some very general, non-technical level. And in the second lecture, I will supply some proofs, or at least outlines, ideas of the proofs, in the case which I know the best, which uh, is the Feigenbaum Kalitraser renormalization. Then in the last talk uh, of the mini course, Marco Martins will move on to dimension two, which is much harder business, and we'll talk about a non renormalization. And so there will be uh, uh, several other. Uh, surrounded talks of the mini program. So today, Misha and Polsky will discuss uh, circle and Ziegel normalization, and then Jeremy Kahn will discuss how the normalization is related to MLC. So, and recent progress in this direction, and in the end, Mitsu Shushikura will wrap it up discussing hopefully parabolic normalization, so he may have some other ideas what to do. So. <coughs> Okay, so that is our program, and so let me start today with this very general discussion. Well, so let me start with, yeah, so normalization is some concept that uh, emerged in dynamics in mid-70s, but it was motivated to a large extent by the ideas coming from the mechanics, And a sort of real technical relations between these two fields is a challenging task, but the general ideas is all the same. And here is this idea. <laughs> so these two guys cannot agree on temperature. So you measure temperature in different scales, and the result depends on the scale. So and what? Renormalization. So and it is the same in quantum field theory, in statistical mechanics, and in dynamics. So, and in order to relate temperatures or other physical parameters or phase portraits in different scales, that is what normalization does for us. So it does relate these parameters when you pass from scale to scale. So that is, that is it. So if you're happy, you don't need to listen to the rest. So it is, <laughs> that is a main idea. Okay, so how this idea shows up in dynamics also in a very general level that is what is happening. So we have some phase space, and so some dynamical system. For me, it will be mostly uh, just discrete dynamical system, one map. We iterate this map on our big phase space. Uh, and uh, so we can take little piece of this phase space. So here is this little piece of the phase space, and just to look how the phase what it looks like in this scale. So then we turn in dynamics, we go around, 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 until we return back to this part of the phase space. And then we would like to compare this return map with the original map F. So to compare, it is small, tiny piece. To compare, it is better to rescale this tiny piece. We rescale it to the original scale. This rescaling, I will use the term rescaling, but it can be linear, it can be nonlinear. So some transformation from which uh, uh, goes from smaller piece to uh, the original scale, and we obtain the normalization. It is our return map, first return map, or maybe more complicated return map, rescaled. So that is, that is how it is. And in, in all, basically, in all occasions of normalization in dynamical systems, we will see this kind of, of picture. So, 
Uh, yes. Um, so I remember that uh, uh, Duda Magdav, so and her sixth birth, birthday party here, so complained about early stages of your career when she was doing some kind of dynamical system iteration on the interval, on the circle actually, and she complained that sort of you go around and around and around, and you never know when to stop. So, so <laughs> <laughs> it was very boring. So, and normalization tells us when to stop. So it is. It makes the life much more interesting, so it speeds up the events, so you just disregard all intermediate stages, you just look at the moment when you return, and rescale, relax, then do it again, and then rescale, relax, do it again, and in this way you obtain some renormalization transform transformation R, which is the operator acting in our space of dynamical systems that we are interested in. In so well, so the dynamical system can depend on parameters. It can can be several parameters, so infinitely many parameters, and we obtain this transformation in this big parameter space. And you can wonder so why it is better to have such a thing because we started with say something one-dimensional, two-dimensional, so which looks pretty tractable, and all of a sudden we, in the, we are in this infinite-dimensional world and have to deal with this infinite-dimensional. System. So, and it turns out that it makes a lot of sense, and actually to deal with this infinite dimensional system could be much easier. This infinite dimensional map could be much, much easier from the dynamical point of view than the original map F. So, and it, it is reflected with the key word hyperbolicity. So, original map can be very weakly hyperbolic, and then it is hard to deal with it, and this renormalization could be strongly hyperbolic map, and then it is. Then it is uh, easier to to deal with such a map. So, mm, but of course, yes. So that is exactly the point. That it is not always uh, easy to set up such uh, procedure. So you need to find a nice space of maps such that the return map looks roughly like the original map. So, and it's it could may may not work. So in particular situations. So, and also, then you need to treat this normalization, and usually one of the key issues is the issue of compactness. So you need to have some compact core of your space. And it is, could be a very difficult problem, which in the core of the whole business, and this is problem which is referred usually as a priori bounds. So it is some selection of some nice small subspace in a big, big untractable space. So, but I will discuss all that in many examples, and we will see. So in examples where the theme works to this or that extent. <coughs> and that is, here is the simplest and actually the case which will be of most interest for us. It is a real quadratic family. Uh -uh. So, uh, yeah, or more generally, real unimodal maps. Unimodal means, means a just map Maps have uh, one extremum, one critical point, and usually for today's talk, I mostly will assume that the point is quadratic. So, and that is the basic example. So this parameter interval C is from negative two to one quarter is selected so that this map has an invariant interval. So we can study dynamics on this invariant interval. And so what was observed uh, long ago is that when we change parameter down from one quarter down, then there is a very interesting phenomenon which is called Dublin bifurcations, cascade of Dublin bifurcations. So in the beginning, we observe an attracting, attracting fixed point, and almost everything converges to this attracting fixed point. Then this point, if there is some parameter value, some parameter value C1, I guess, it's here, it's here, well, so C1, this bifurcation parameter value, when this attracting point loses its attractiveness but gives birth to an attracting cycle of period two. So here is it. On this parameter interval in between C1 and C2, we see an attracting cycle of period two and almost everything converges to this attracting cycle of period two. Then there is the next bifurcation point when this attracting cycle of period two loses its attractiveness and gives birth to an attracting cycle of period four, it persists for some time, etc., etc. So we have this cascade of Dublin bifurcations. So, and this 
a cascade converges to the limiting point, which is called the Feigenbaum, the Feigenbaum point. So it actually had been known since 60s, so this cascade of Dublin bifurcations. But in 70s, people took a closer look at what happens here, and they made several striking discoveries. So that is a story from 70s. Uh -uh. So it is so-called universality phenomenon discovered by Feigenbaum, independently by Kula and Presser. And uh, so, well, first of all, if you look at the quadratic family, if you look at this cascade of Dublin bifurcations, then you Feigenbaum discovered that, well, found out, and so just on using uh, just uh, hand calcul calculator, that the sequence of bifurcation converges to the limiting parameter with some exponential rate. Well, there is some, some exponent, some lambda, which controls this rate of convergence. So, well, it's OK. So maybe not so surprising, but then he looked and <laughs> sure. Yes. So the thing independent of the coordinates is the difference and maybe the okay. ratio. And well that's yeah, to reformulate the question. So and then he asked this question about this lambda probably, yeah. <laughs> so, so universal that is what I say in the in the moment. So that Figenbaum looked in some other family, like sign family, some family which that qualitatively looks like that. And if you take a family of unimodal maps that qualitatively looks like that, you observe a similar sequence of Dublin bifurcation converging to some limiting parameter value, and you can find the rate of convergence, and it turns out that the rate is independent on the of the family in question. So, and that is what is referred to parameter universality. So that this is universal lambda, which does not depend on particular family. Well, in the large class of families, certainly you need to specify some class of families, but it is large class of unimodal maps with quadratic, quadratic critical point. So <coughs> it is, so could be, could be quadratic, could be, could be sine, could be many, many other choices, and this lambda is the same and probably transcendental. <laughs> so, so that was... Uh, this striking observation that Feigenbaum made. And sometime, maybe sometime later, there was a similar observation in the parameter plane, in the dynamical plane, sorry. So it was parameter universality, and then there is a dynamical universality. If we now take a, take a look at this Feigenbaum map itself, so uh, the dynamics of this map, then what we will observe is two intervals which are permuted under dynamics. And then inside of these two intervals, we will observe, in, inside of each of them, we will ob observe two more intervals, and we have the cycle of four intervals altogether, which are permuted under dynamics. And in this cycle of four intervals, we, we can find a cycle of eight intervals that are permuted under, under dynamics. These cycles are gradually created in this process of bifurcations. First, we create after first bifurcation, two intervals. After second bifurcation, we create four intervals, etc. And in the end, we observe all this hierarchy of intervals. And of course, this hierarchy of intervals creates us the counter, a counter set. And it turns out, and it is not uh, difficult to prove, that this kind well, it's actually quite difficult to prove that it is a counter set, that it has empty interior. So, but at least numerically, it looks like that. Uh, and uh, this counter set is a global attractor for our dynamical system. So almost all orbits converge to, to this attractor. But what is my even more interesting is that we have this counter attractor. So at that time, people were quite used already to counter structures, and that attractors, that attractors often have such an intricate structure, that this counter set has a universal geometry. So what does it mean? 
It means that if you take some other Feigenbaum map in the sign family, for instance, so, and you look at the scaling factors of this counter set, so the relative ratios of length of intervals of next generation inside of intervals of the previous generation, then the scaling will be independent, asymptotically at least, independent on the particular family in question. So there will be this universality, so we have, we have this huge infinitely dimensional space of maps with such dynamics, with such an attractor, and this attractor is rigid, so it has a rigid, small scale, small scale structure. So uh, this is something that mm, was not really observed, had not really been observed bef before in dynamics, and it cried for explanation. Uh, so the discovery was made by physicists, and so they first found a physical explanation for it, a beautiful, beautiful picture that they made to explain this phenomenon. And so mathematicians started to refer the, to this picture as renormalization conjecture. And here we have the situation when we can easily define this renormalization transformation. So because after the second bifurcation, we have these two intervals, two intervals which are permuted under dynamics, just the, the highest level. So it's just two intervals is enough. So we can take the second iterator, the return map, here will be just the second iterate of the, of the original map. So, and this second iterate will also be a unimodal map. So, because we have critical point here under the first iterate, but there is no critical point here. We return back univalently. So, the return map is again unim a map in the same unimodal class. So, we can think of this return map as the renormalization of the original map. And that is how this renormalization is defined in this particular, under this particular circumstances. So we have, uh, in the case when we have such a periodic interval of period two, after the first bifurcation, for instance, so we just consider the second iterate of our map, you rescale, and this is this case, it is good enough to rescale linearly, rescale linearly our interval to the original size, and that is a normalization. And now we think of this as some transformation acting in some big space of unimodal space to be specified. So that is a big space of unimodal maps. And so, and here is the conjecture. So uh, absolutely fantastic conjecture uh, is that uh, this normalization has a fixed point in our space. There is a unique fixed point uh, under normalization. So if we do this procedure, take the second iterate of the map and rescale, then we obtain exactly the same map F star. And it is, of course, completely non obvious because it is highly nonlinear operation, the second iterate. So and there is no a priori reasons why there should be a map which will be exactly geometrically the same as, uh, the, uh, as the original map. Uh, after normalization, exactly the same as the original so map. Yes, the host of dimension is invariant. So one can, mathematically, that can be stated by just by saying that uh, there is a smooth map, there is a diffeomorphism from, from line to line, which maps one counter set to another counter set, respecting dynamics on the counter set. So the smooth structure, the smooth structure on this counter set is, is universal. C1 plus epsilon. Okay. C1 plus epsilon. Yeah. Well, of course, in those early stages, people did not <laughs> uh, did not bother to uh, ask such fine questions. They was asked a few years later. <clears throat> so, yeah. So there is a fixed point, and moreover, this fixed point is hyperbolic in the dimensional sense. Namely, there is a co-dimension one stable manifold for this point, and so if we start take a point on this table manifold, and start to renormalize this point, it is a map, we start to renormalize one, twice, the, stars, the points are infinitely renormalizable on this table manifold, then we will converge to this fixed point at the expo at exponential rate, and there is a transverse unstable manifold of dimension one, and if we start to take a point here, start to renormalize it, it will escape at exponential map. Eventually, uh, it will be out of the domain of renormalization, but close 
close to this point, we can iterate normalization and the point will start to escape. So it is a usual notion of capability in dynamical systems and the conjecture was that this normalization transformation so satisfies this property. So it has such a fixed, such a hyperbolic fixed point. And it beautifully, immediately beautifully explains both universalities because if you take a Feigenbaum map with this counter attractor, it means, it should mean, well, so I keep missing. So it should mean that this map is on the stable manifold. You start to renormalize this map. Normalization means that you look at this counter attractor in smaller and smaller scales, and in smaller and smaller scales, it looks exactly like this fixed point. So the universality, the universal geometry of this attractor is actually the geometry of this fixed point. This fixed point controls everything. And on the other hand, if you, uh, if you take point here and can co go through the sequence of doubling by Fourier, so it is one parameter family of maps. So this unstable manifold is one parameter family of maps. So and on this one parameter family of unimodal maps, there is a sequence of bifurcation points. And this sequence of bifurcation points are related by dynamics. So they converge to the fixed point. And if you start to enter renormalize it, go back, back in time in, uh, in normalization, they will converge to F star with the rate, which is just the unstable eigenvalue, this lambda, the unstable eigenvalue of our renormalization transformation at this fixed point. And moreover, if we take any other one parameter family of maps, which is transverse to the stable manifold, so within the domain of validity of this picture, and we consider the corresponding sequence of Dublin bifurcations, then, so it is very easy to see for, dy for dynamical reasons that the rate of convergence here of this sequence of bifurcations will be the same. So it will be the rate lambda, which is unstable eigenvalue of the normalization transformation, and which does not depend on a particular one parameter family in question. So, <coughs> so that, is, that was the discovery, this was the explanation. They were physicists, they were completely happy. So it was for, I think that for them it was like a, the end of the story. So because, so there is experiment, there is theory, everything is clear. And there were much more experiments immediately done after that with physical theorems, with physical systems like fluid systems even so, and uh, numerical experiments and the, in, in high dimensional situations and all over the place people were able to find this kind of universality with the same, with the same uh, scaling geometry. So it was remarkable. Of course, for mathematicians, it looked like it's the beginning of the story because, so, well, this picture explains those phenomena, but what explains this picture? So it, is, it was equation. So mathematicians like to have proofs and like to understand, some of them at least understand underlying structures behind these proofs. So, <clears throat> well, so, so it was the beginning of the long story uh, that attempted to understand this phenomenon, so let me present this long story in one slide. Just <coughs> so that is where we went through. Of course, the story is incomplete. There is much more was going on, much more names should have been included, but so uh, that is abbreviated version. Uh -uh. So, well, uh, from a mathematical point of view, the major breakthrough was uh, Landford's proof of this particular renormalization conjecture, at least locally. So he was able to prove that there exists a fixed point, and this fixed point is hyperbolic for normalization transformation. But so he proved his proof used computers. So he first localized numerically this fixed point approximately, and then used rigorous computer estimates to prove that there is an actual fixed point there. So from a mathematical point of view, at least locally near this fixed point, the phenomenon was confirmed. So I remember I said in, in uh, mid-80s, uh, Sinai gave a colloquium talk in Leningrad so about this neuronization phenomenon and this new proof. And he said that a kind of this, we, we observe emergence of a new type of mathematics, mathematics where computers will be intrinsic part of the proofs. So. Well, it looked very interesting, but still not completely satisfactory, uh, I would say, because first of all, it certainly confirms correctness, but does not reveal the structures, underlying structures. And second, so we can easily generalize this phenomenon, not and observe them in our quadratic family, 
not only for doublings, but for triplings, for quadruplings, etc., or even different periods uh, intertwined. So what should we do? So go from period two to period three and check it numeric and prove it numeric numericals into period four, five, etc. Of course, it would it would take a long time to uh, go to the end of the story. So, uh, well, so mathematicians did not stop here, tried to find a proof that would avoid use of computers. And there was many ingredients were supplied. There was a good progress in early 80s. So one of the key names here, Andy Epstein, but many people, many other people were involved. Many uh, ingredients were supplied, at least in the period Dublin. So it was almost, the proof was almost there in early 80s. And then I remember that uh, how this Sullivan, I saw the proceedings of the Berkeley Congress with, with Dennis's, Dennis's article in this proceedings, and it was a completely different approach outlined there. So approach which used so the idea of the type Mueller contraction. So he designed certain infinitely dimensional type Mueller space where you could immediately see that the normalization oper operator is at least weakly contracting, and so, if you're lucky enough to prove that it is strongly contracting in this Teichmüller space, then it's the end of the story. And you obtain this result not only locally, but globally. And you can do this, of course, for all other periods, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it was so wonderful, wonderful to see this approach. Very exciting. And I was somehow, I, feel, I remember that I felt this confidence that it just works. And I was sure that so, then, so very soon we will see uh, complete proof of the whole conjecture. So, and then a few years later, I came to, uh, to the West, so to Stony Brook, and so what I saw was quite amazing. So there was so much activities going <laughs> around this, so uh, this program of uh, proving the normalization conjecture by the methods of Teichmüller theory, by these uh, ideas of geometric analysis. So it was like every day there were 10 new proofs, and then next day, uh, eight of them were disqualified, and then, but this, uh, it continued and went on, and went on. it was uh, amazing craziness. So, <coughs> it was, so, yeah, it was very exciting times. And so, and in early 90s, Dennis uh, actually succeeded of proving rigorously that uh, they exist in the space he designed, and I will tell later, so what is the space? We will discuss it in much more detail, what is the space? In the space he designed, there exists a unique fixed point. Uh, uh, and actually, in this space, everything converges to this fixed point. Uh, well, it is, we are talking, so it is all was about construction of the stable fixed point and the stable manifold of this fixed point. So what Dennis constructed is a stable manifold in certain space and proved that in this stable manifold, at least weekly, everything converges to a unique fixed point. And then, about at the same time, Macmillan, so got into this business, and he uh, used some other ideas, but also related to technical ideas and ideas from hyperbolic geometry to prove that actually uh, uh, the convergence in this stable manifold to the fixed point is exponential. It is a very, very important part of the statement that the point hyperbolic means that convergence to this fixed point is exponential. So it is where we are here. So exponential, he proved exponential contractions using some other geometric ideas. But so what I, I, when I was looking at this, I was wondering why people did not pay quite enough attention to the unstable direction. After all, unstable direction, it controls the parameter universality, was was the original <coughs> discovery. And so I gave some thought to the unstable direction, and so I gave a proof of the expansion in this unstable direction, in the direction transverse, transverse to, the, to the stable manifold and then went on to unbounded combinatorics. I will tell about this a little bit later with some uh, interesting applications. And all this development from Dennis to here, it was about analytic maps. It was some nice space of holomorphic maps. So, but then De Faria, Wellington de Mel, and Alberto Pinta, they went further to deal with the smooth case. But, uh, so it was not like smooth case was dealt independently. So actually, analytic case was intrinsic part of the picture. After all, analytic case provides for us already the fixed point and an unstable manifold of the fixed point. It stays the same in the bigger space of smooth maps. And the only thing to, to prove is extend correctly the stable manifold 
into this bigger, bigger functional space. So, but I will not talk about smooth case today. And then, uh, so young people started to come into this game, and new ideas started to appear. And recently, we worked out with Artur Avila new proofs of this stable existence of the fixed point and exponential contraction to this fixed point. So, and it is actually like closing up the cycle because these new proofs very much in the spirit of the original Dennis's idea to have a global space and global contraction with respect to some natural metric. The, our choice of metric was a little bit different and maybe it worked out a little bit so more efficiently with this choice, but it is in the very much in the spirit of the original Dennis's program. <clears throat> So, and, uh, so that is that what I will be talking about next time. So about these new proofs so of this pegging palm contract. So not maybe only about it, but it will be part of the next talk. Okay, here is the story. <coughs> and let me now tell you what is, so I will go further with some applications and then so other occasions of renormalizations. So what is the full normalization Hashu? So it is, so we have this normalization operator, which so far we defined on some strip, strip, some subspace of our functional space, where Dublin normalization is well defined. It was Dublin normalization, but we can consider similar operator for tripling, and of course for tripling we would observe a similar fixed point, so in similar phenomenon, and then we can consider period five. Actually, there will be several strips here corresponding to period five, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we can put so on each of these strips, we can consider its own normalization operator. But we can now put this into uh, consider this as a one normalization transformation, with, which is peacefully, piecewise defined, piecewise continuous. So on each strip, it is its own, but we think of this as a single normalization. Transformation and so, the so my theorem about mm, full normalization Hoshu uh, was that uh, this operator, this big operator, his, it has an invariant set, which is which is called Hoshu, which, which is encoded by by infinite sequences, uh, by infinite sequences in infinitely many symbols. The symbols are responsible for types of renormalizations. And on this invariant set, A, there is, on this invariant set, this invariant set is strongly hyperbolic. It's strongly hyperbolic in the sense that it has co-dimension one lamination where the orbits, when we take the two points in the same leaf of this lamination, then these orbits will get together exponentially fast under iteration. And there is uh, unstable lamination of dimension one where the orbits uh, pulled apart at exponential rate. So clearly such a horseshoe somehow must encode all these universalities for all periods all together. So one picture for all periods simultaneously. Oh. <laughs> no, no, uh, yeah, sorry, so they don't rotate. It is so, uh, like Alberto Verkhovsky always shows hyperbolicity, they do this and that. So, so <laughs> but I cannot reproduce Alberto's way. But so it's contraction in horizontal direction and expansion in the vertical direction. Of course, it is impressionistic picture. It is infinitely dimensional space. So, but you you should think that you have these strips where the horizontal direction is infinite dimensional, co-dimension one, and vertical direction is one-dimensional. And so in horizontal direction, you have contraction. In vertical direction, you have expansion. And on each strip, simultaneously. So you create this horseshoe picture in this horseshoe picture. But so that is a more or less precise statement which tells you what this horseshoe picture. So how smooth is this R, this big universal R you're getting? It is very good map. So it is analytic map. It's so in this, we are dealing, we are working in the complex space, actually, and it is a holomorphic map, because after all, it is just the second iterate of the map F. So, well, I think that this question is trickier in the smooth categories, but in the analytic category, so you can, should, so your map, my map R is real analytic, or complex analytic, if you ex oh. extend it, complex. 
So I, somehow this is a mixed, mixed picture. I'm not going here in the details, but somehow the picture is valid as it is put here in the real analytic space of real maps, but it is proved in complex extension, holomorphic extension of this real analytic space. <coughs> so it is, there is some mixture of complex and real. And my main interest for that was for proving such a result was to prove that the set of infinitely normalizable maps in the real quadratic family, the infinitely normalizable parameters. So what is, so let us take our quadratic family. Well, it is D here, so, but let us, let us think about D equal to two. So let us take this quadratic family and uh, the maps in this quadratic family can be, some of these maps renormalizable and some of not with some period. So, uh, and if they're renormalizable, you can renormalize them, and then this ne next map can be renormalizable again, etc. We can consider the infinite renormalizable parameter values. Parameter values for which these maps are infinitely renormalizable take, take all these parameter values. It will be like counter set of unbounded combinatorics. And so the statement is that this counter set with unbounded combinatoric has zero Lebesgue, Lebesgue measures. So, and it can be easily derived with this picture. So just to take the transverse curve here and to argue that our horseshoe intersects this transverse curve in the set of measures zero. It is more or less, more or less standard, standard techniques in dynamics. So it was one of the applications, one, from, one of the uh, uh, good applications of the renormalization, renormalization theory, but it required, required to construct this horseshoe simultaneously for all combinatorial types. Uh -uh. Okay, so, and again, the motivation for that result was the following regular or stochastic dichotomy in the real quadratic family. So, uh, so there are two types of maps. Well, there are three types of maps in the real quadratic family, but so I, so here I define two of them. So regular maps or also hyperbolic maps. It is the maps which have an attracting cycle. So we have an attracting a cycle of points which it attracts almost everything. The multiply in this cycle is strictly less than one, and almost almost anything converges to this cycle. These maps are called regular corresponding parameter values are called regular parameter values. There are stochastic parameter values, so for which uh, satisfying the properties that this corresponding map has an absolutely continuous invariant measure. And if it has such a measure, then this measure automatically has positive Lyapunov exponents, so there is instability, positive entropy, there is exponential instability of this measure. And almost all points with respect, almost with respect to the Lebesgue measure, so take X, almost any with respect to the Lebesgue measure, then the Birkhoff averages will be asymptotically equidistributed with respect to this invariant measure. Such measures are these days referred as scenario bone measures. So you take almost any Lebesgue, almost any Lebesgue, uh, almost any point with respect to the Lebesgue measure, take its asymptotic distribution, and it is equidistributed with respect to the scenario bone measure, which is absolutely continuous invariant measure. Both of these sets are important sets in the parameter plane. This set is, for instance, uh, open set. This set of regular parameter values is obvious that it is open set and actually had been proven that it is a dense set. And for this set, it was a Jacobson theorem that tells that the set of such parameters has positive measures. So from the measure theoretic point of view, you cannot disregard either of these sets. And so, so my theorem uh, of late 90s says that for almost any parameter value in the quadratic family, this, the corresponding quadratic map F sub C is either regular, so it has such kind of behavior, or stochastic, it has such kind of, of behavior. And so it is a long story to prove this theorem, so there are many ingredients, but the last step of this story is actually this full normalization question, which tells us that the set of infinitely normalizable parameter values has zero measure, so it can be disregarded from this. Otherwise, there would be the third class of maps we should include, so we can disregard that third class of maps from the picture. <coughs> okay, so that is the canonical picture of the real quadratic family. So where you see this intertwining between regular and stochastic maps, this 
these white windows, it is regular windows, where the map has here, in this big window, the map has an attraction cycle of period three. Yeah, in the beginning, it is cascade of Dublin bifurcations. It is our fixed point. It is periodic point of period two, periodic point of period four, etc. And then, then you see that close to the end of the story, everything is dark because it looks like everything is very much stochastic here. Of course, there are these white windows all over the place there, are, but they become very, very narrow. And so the set of positive measure, the, this is the density point for the set of, of stochastic maps. And, but all together, these uh, regular maps and stochastic maps, they fill in almost uh, almost all parameter, almost almost all the whole parameter interval. <coughs> so is it is so black means it means that the critical point that the well what does it mean? So it, well it means if you take a typical point, say this typical point will go around around the interval in a stochastic way. So the, in the in the end of the story we have the Chebyshev map when so the interval has an absolutely continuous invariant measure supported on the whole interval. And close to this Chebyshev map, we observe a very similar, very similar story with very high probability. And if you take a sort of random parameter value nearby, then you observe a very similar story. A white is a regular measure, but they are completely invisible here towards the end of the story. So they, they are, of course, present. They are, of course, there. So that is as much as you can hope for some family of chaotic dynamical systems. You would like to have a picture of behavior of almost all orbits for almost all parameter values. And that is this picture, at least in the simplest possible nonlinear family, real quadratic family, this picture is at least available. Uh, so, uh, yes, and Yeah, there is some measure zero set, which is completely, this infinite normalizable maps completely invisible here. And so, well, they are actually visible <laughs> because we see this cascade of Dublin bifurcation and we see this point. And similar cascade of Dublin bifurcation can start, starts from here and one can blow up a little bit and to see the corresponding point. They are visible, but still they have measure zero. Yeah. <clears throat> Yes, yeah, so, well, there was this, this philosophy that this Feigenbaum point is the boundary point between regular dynamics and chaotic dynamics. So these stochastic maps, they appeared first after the Feigenbaum point. Before Feigenbaum point, everything is regular, and after, some of them appear, but so they're not that, that many, and they're maybe less chaotic than closer to the end of the parameter interval. <clears throat> okay. So let's see how we are doing. Uh -uh. So, okay. So, but as I mentioned, when I described the story, is that holomorphic methods and so ideas from geometry and complex analysis started to play the crucial role in this business since this Berkeley Congress with Dennis's, Dennis's program. And so what kind of holomorphic dynamics? So let me uh, at least uh, uh, indicate what kind of space we are dealing with. So we need to extend the notion of a unimodal map from the interval to the complex plane. And this extension was done by Doody and Hubbard. It is a notion of a quadratic-like map. Quadratic-like map is a holomorphic map from smaller disk to a strictly bigger disk. It is important that there is some some non-empty, some definite annulus here, some annulus, non-degenerate non annulus here in between these two disks. So the map is holomorphic, and the map is degree two branch covering. So it maps the boundary of this disk to the boundary of that with degree two. And so there is one critical point inside. And if we want to think about this as a dynamical system, we should start to iterate points. And of course, some points can escape through this fundamental annulus, and we uh, must stop our iteration procedure. And some points will not escape. And we just mark all non-escaping points, and we will obtain what is called the field Julia set, K of F. 
So, and the Julia set is just the boundary, the boundary of the field Julia set. Of course, if you take the quadratic polynomial itself and restrict it to a big disk U near infinity, big disk with the boundary near infinity, then you obtain such quadratic-like maps. So you can think of quadratic maps as particular cases of quadratic-like maps. And that is our that is our space of maps with which we want to work. So and so there is a basic dichotomy, which is basically classical dichotomy of Fatou and Julia, generalized to this class of maps. Then the Julia set and field Julia set and the Julia set are either connected, and in this case, the critical point is not escaping. The critical point stays, stands, stays in this domain, or is a counter set. In this case, the critical point escapes under several iterates. So there is this. Uh, uh, basic dichotomy. So that is the space of maps, and next time I will give some outline so how this space of maps can be used in order to prove the normalization conjecture. But at the moment, I would like to go in some other directions and maybe and try to uh, give an idea of some other renormalization schemes, which also so bring very nice consequences. Okay, so let me skip the pictures. Well, maybe just. So one standard picture of the Julia set. So just do a D rabbit. So it is for quadratic polynomial. So it is the counter, counter set picture. And of course, once we have this, we can immediately we can immediately start to partition the parameter plane. Now we are in the complex quadratic family. C is a complex parameter, and we can partition the the parameter plane according to as the Julia, the Julia set is a counter set or it is connected. So, and here is the red region when the Julia set is a counter set, and this black region, which is called the Mandelbrot set, is the region where the uh, Julia set is connected. So it is an amazing set. So it is really, so people played with it. So it's com incredible complexity if you start to blow up. And mathematicians just, it's a very dangerous set. So you just, you select, you see, so you select some piece of this set, and you would like to understand something about this piece, and then you, 20 years later, you discover that you're still there, living in this piece, stuck forever there. So <laughs> it is, <laughs> so some people spend their life here on the real slice of this set. <laughs> some, and, and it is not an easy life, I can tell you so. <laughs> So Feigenbaum is right here. So we have this cascade of Dublin bifurcation, this period two, period four, et cetera, and so here is a period. So it's much better visible in the complex pictures. So, and there is a cusp of the Mandelbrot set, point one quarter. So you can spend easily your life just in the neighborhood of <laughs> So some people like to go around the main cardioid. So it is lifetime projects. So some people go to the tips. Maybe it's a little easier to go. To. When you go a little bit deeper to the, into this Mandelbrot set, somehow it turns out to be a little bit easier for some strange reason. So you can wander around. And so once you're there, you will never leave it. So that is so be, beware of that. So be. <coughs> OK, so <coughs> well, and there is, yeah, I'm running out of time. There is this remarkable conjecture formulated by Doherty and Hubbard, MLC conjecture. So that suggests that the Mandelbrot set is not only connected, it was one of the first theorems about Mandelbrot set that is connected, but it is locally connected. And sounds like a little technical question, but it is a very important and profound question as it turned out. So, uh, so several reasons to ask this question. One of these reasons that if the answer is yes, then you have an explicit topological model for the Mandelbrot set. So just you can really describe it as a so-called pinched model of the disk. So there is some hyperbolic lamination in the disk. You pinch the disk along this lamination, and it's very explicit lamination, and you get the Mandelbrot set. Then this is conjecture is stronger than no invariant line fields conjecture that was mentioned by Dick yesterday, and this one is, in, is stronger than the conjecture that the hyperbolic map maps are dense in the complex quadratic family this time. So, so all these would be consequences of the MLC conjecture. And there is one more good reason to study this, why this conjecture is so interesting, because it is very similar, so very closely connected to the 
and in lamination conjecture, which was mentioned yesterday, because the MLC conjecture can be formulated as a combinatorial rigidity problem if two maps are combinatorially equivalent into some, some well-defined sense. It is combinatorial equivalence is some notion which is weaker than topological equivalence. I don't have time to define it. Maybe next time I will do that. So if two maps are combinatorial, two quadratic maps are combinatorially equivalent and none of them is hyperbolic, then the parameters must be equal. So if there is some rough, rough equivalence between dynamical systems, then they are geometrically the same. They, the parameters coincide. So it is exact, sounds exactly like most of rigidity that Bruce was talking about, like, and like its generalizations due to Thurston. Yeah. Yes, it's one. One is enough, yes. No. So a little bit. No? Uh, ah, I see. Because there is something on the boundary. Okay, C and C, C prime are not hyperbolic, I guess. I should say that, yeah. Because you can go to the boundary. Okay, so, see. Uh, um, okay, so that is rough motivations for these conjectures. For these conjectures, so I will skip more because I think that I'm indeed running out of time. But let me formulate some advances in this conjecture in the past 20 years. But for these advances, we again need the notion of normalization. When for conjecture was formulated, when the conjecture was formulated, then uh, there was no relevance to normalization whatsoever. So at least no visible relevance. It turns out that it is deeply connected to the concept of normalization. And so let me tell you what is the connection, at least. Uh, roughly. So first of all, we need a notion of complex normalization. So uh, here is this notion. It is also, I think, due to Doody and Hubbard. So you have some Julia set, quadratic like maybe some connected Julia set. It assumes that you can find a disk which goes around and around and around and it turns back onto itself as a quadratic like map. So then this is our part. Hmm? Over, over itself, yes. Over itself. It goes over. That is what we have to do to create something non-trivial. We have to ask it to go over itself. So, and then we are in this setting as the rough picture in the beginning described. So we can just consider this first return map, f to the p, which is a quadratic-like map in this sense. We assume that this quadratic-like map has also connected Julia set, connected little Julia set. So that is part of the assumptions. And there are some also some other subtle assumptions introduced by Kurt, but I will skip them today. And that is the notion of renormalization. We can say, what does it mean? The map is renormalizable, complex map is renormalizable or not renormalizable in this sense. And to each renormalization, there is an associated combinatorics. So of course, part of the combinatorial data is this period P, but also there is more to it because if we look and these domains, or the corresponding little Julia set, there is a little Julia set here, there is a little Julia set here and here, they are placed in some way inside of the big Julia set. So we can describe this as so-called Hubbard graph. So the vertices of this Hubbard graph are just this little Julia set, and connections go through the big Julia set. So there is a Hubbard graph associated to this picture, and there is a natural dynamics, induced dynamics, on this Hubbard graph. And this is combinatorial invariant attached to this normalization. So each normalization comes together with its combinatorics. And now one can ask a question, which maps in the quadratic family, if you take those parameters, which are renormalizable with a certain combinatorics, so what will be the set of parameters? And so Doody and Hubbard in the 80s, they proved that this set of parameters fix combinatorics and take the set of parameters which are renormalizable with these combinatorics. It is a little copy of the Mandelbrot set inside of the big Mandelbrot set. So, well, that is one, one of the pictures of such a copies with some environment, so it is, of course, blown up copy, but even on the big picture of the Mandelbrot set, with little microscope, you can see copies here and there of little, of the, which look exactly pieces of the big Mandelbrot set that look exactly like the whole Mandelbrot set. So, and you see that it's really undistinguishable. You, you cannot say so. You cannot say the difference between this set and the original. And the normalization theory it explains, at least to some extent, to some in some qualitative way, why these copies are so undistinguishable from the big Julia set. And so again, I will will probably discuss this tomorrow. 
Yes, that is, that is another, that's exactly a complex universality associated to this complex renormalization. So, mm -mm. okay, so how much time do we have? Five minutes. Okay, so I think I wanted to discuss other types of normalization, maybe, but, but now I have two times to talk, so maybe I will postpone this discussion just as a preview. Let me put this slide on, because there has been very exciting development in holomorphic dynamics recently, namely, so there was uh, proof that there exists a Julia set in the quadratic family who, that has positive Lebesgue like measure, so positive area. So it is a theorem by Buff and Sherita, uh, proved like five years ago, and it certainly breaks the point of when the Sullivan's dictionary breaks, because about at the same time it was proved that the Alfers conjecture for Kleinian group, groups is true. So all limit sets of the Kleinian group, of course, no way, if they are no way dense, then they have uh, area zero. And here the situation is different. So one should be cautious now in applying Sullivan's dictionary in these kind of equations, obviously. And this was realization of the OD strategy. The OD set up the strategy in the early 90s, and then several people were working on it. And at the same time, there has been several of his students, Buff and Shabot, Buff and Sherita are his students. He is uh, kept involved in his students in this project, and eventually very successfully. But what is very interesting, if to look at the proof of this result, there are three other normalization theories involved. So besides the one, besides the one that I described already, this quadratic-like maps on unimodal normalization, there are three other involved. And now I don't have time to talk about that, but next time I will come back to it and will at least briefly show you these three other theories that led to this result. One by Jacos, another by McMullen, and another by and the third one by Shishikura. So, so people are here, and so some of these normalization theories probably will be discussed more in more detail in uh, <coughs> later, later this week. Okay, so let me, but now let me skip this renormalization series and uh, let me wrap up this talk somehow. So, and I would like to wrap it up with um, discussion of Sullivan's Dictionary. So, because, so Dick is giving mini course on this topic, but sort of the idea was that this would be kind of a contest between representatives of two fields, so just comparing, so trying to see so what is going on and why the things go, go on this way and that way, what is the differences and what are the crucial, what is, what is the similarities and what are the crucial differences between the fields. So let us, let me put up a little diagram. So on Sullivan's dictionary. So here is the current situation. Here is the current situation. Of course, the biggest success which originated the whole story is this line, Alpha's finiteness theorem versus Sullivan's no wandering domain theorem. Then, so there is no invariant line field, which was proved by Dennis already in the 70s, and which is an open problem in, in holomorphic dynamics. Then there is problem of density of hyperbolicity, checked in in the, so it is the line here. Yeah, it is the line of Kleinian groups and hyperbolic geometry. This is the line of holomorphic dynamics, obviously. That is the column of holomorphic dynamics. So density of hyperbolicity is wide open. So there are these two conjectures I mentioned. MLC conjecture for the quadratic family. There is an analogous Thurston and delamination conjecture for hyperbolic manifolds and Kleinian groups, proved recently. It will be a discussion in this, in this conference. And by the way, so here the difference is even bigger because the exact analog of this conjecture is even not formulated for high degree holomorphic maps, for high degree rational maps, but even for polynomials. Literally speaking, it, is, it breaks for high degree polynomials. So the, the analog is formulated only in degree two. So it is still one needs to think, one needs Thurston to think how to formulate, <laughs> formulate the precise analog of anti delamination conjecture for higher degree polynomials and rational functions. It is even harder. Well, then, Alpha's measure conjecture, well, here I think that it's a success story. It breaks, so, but there is a definitive result, so here. So there is, 
Uh, and there is also another topic which I may have time to discuss later. It is host door dimension. And for Kleinian group, there is a precise de Hart dichotomy when the uh, limit set has host door dimension less than two in, host, in the holomorphic dynamics. Uh, so the, there are examples of this kind and that kind, this kind and that kind, but there is no precise de Hart. I mean, probably it is impossible to say exactly. So when house door dimension of a Julia set is equal to two. And so let me now, let me now to finish it up with a quiz for people here. For, first of all, very last line, it was a host, about house door dimension. The question is whether house door dimension of the Julia set is equal to two or less than two. It is, yeah, another question. Yeah, by the way, Dennis uh, so produced many examples of limit sets of Kleinian groups with host door dimension two maximal possible host door dimension. So, and then there was later on, there was full criterion worked out on this side of the story, but not on this side of the story. Examples are here, but the story is unfinished. Uh, okay, so here is a quiz. Okay, so of course the question immediately arises. So, so why is holomorphic dynamics is so much behind? So everything is solved on this side, and there is all kind of open questions. So and you have an answer right away. So okay, so it is a good answer. So but let let us see. Uh, yeah, I will suggest several answers, and you can answer online. So just. <laughs> Okay, so the answers will be of two types. They will be odd answers and even answers. And there will be some supersymmetry going on. So the first answer is really odd answer. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know who, who put it here. I don't know. So it is maybe a year. So, okay, so here is uh, a natural answer. So rational maps are not reversible. And let me say reversible here rather than non-invertible, because you can build up, so you can make non-invertible map into invertible by the construction of the inverse limit, and you can do a lot of things similar to what you, you do in the Kleinian groups and construct even geodesic flow, etc. But geodesic flow for Kleinian groups will be reversible. There will be a symmetry which relates forward flow and backward flow, and the symmetry is still not there for rational maps, and I think that it is very crucial issue, at least for geometric issues like measure, positive measure, house door dimension, it is crucial issue. And of course, there is very dramatic violation of invertibility. There are critical points for rational maps, and uh, there are none for, for Kleinian groups. And now, this answer is better, I think. <laughs> So we are safe. <laughs> okay, so let us go to an even answer. Well, yeah, there is a hyperbolic three-dimensional manifold, and there is a whole machine. It sounds actually here like a tautology because so uh, advantage of people in hyperbolic geometry is they have a hyperbolic manifold. So, but there is some, maybe some sense of it. So from the point of view of Kleinian groups, definitely there is some sense. Okay, another odd answer. No, it's not that one. <laughs> so. People had some advantage in hyperbolic geometry, so Dennis was there a bit earlier. So, and another, okay, so there is a good answer. I think that people, when you fill in your, your quiz form, then think about this. So, yeah, this Mandelbrot set is really a rich set, and there is a lot, lot of different phenomena going on there. And in particular, these examples of sets of positive measure, positive area, were built up using uh, Kramer points, it is points where near which the fixed points where the map is not locally linearizable. So, and there is no such a phenomenon in hyperbolic geometry. And so there is more complexity, more complexity in dynamics apparently uh, going on. So, uh, so this could be a good answer. Well, so, well, the Dennis gave one more is that there is an ambient finite dimensional Lie group for the Kleinian group and for iterates of rational functions. So the degree goes to infinity, there is no ambient. I was thinking about that, but I could not find its odd, odd counterpart, so I skipped it. Well, and uh, so, uh, well, and of course, 
as always. <coughs> <laughs> so happy birthday. <laughs> Any questions or advice? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have a question. Why are the two subjects similar? And you may know better. <laughs> <laughs> There is a Beltramian equation in both, so I guess it's one of the answers. There is quasi, there is quasi, there are quasi-conformal deformations in both, so one of the answers. So I don't know any really deeper way of saying it. So that's a question. Uh, yes, sorry. Yeah, it is, it is a kind of common denominator for this. Uh, one could say uh, uh, the theory of pseudogroups. Pseudogroups as a common denominator for both of these. And in particular, one can think about, say, algebraic correspondences. And there has been some interesting work done in that direction by Sean Dulit, for instance, and then Rose. So there, but uh, well, so far theory has not been developed too far. So it is, it is one of the possible answers that they can be, could be embedded in some so general, more general theory, but this general theory is way, way behind both of these. So way <laughs> behind. So it is really only few steps, some examples, <coughs> not much is done. So maybe, so if people succeed eventually developing to real depth the theory of correspondences, algebraic correspondences, then this could be a good, good answer. So, so yeah. if I could just amplify that last point, here in the theory of climbing semi-groups, there are maps like V goes to A, V plus or minus one. And all the transformations in that semi-group are beautiful, Mobius, even affi transformations, and yet the topic is almost as rich as the middle. What, what is it? Z goes to A, V plus or minus one. So but it's not the settle group gives you much more structure than so the industry group, which is generated by going close forward in the Semi group of semi group of it is a, is a semi group is a semi group of contractions with overlapping images, something like yeah. that. It doesn't have to be contractions. Oh. Yeah, let's say yeah, well simple case, yeah. Yeah, two maps and you only go forward, but you're within Here we go.